equation one in the non calculator is adding together two mixed numbers. The best way to do that is first of all by adding the whole numbered parts. So we have our two plus the three, which gives us five. And then we need to add on the two fraction parts one quarter add one fifth. So currently these two fractions have different denominators. When adding or subtracting uh, two fractions together, we need to remember that the denominators need to be the same. So multiplying this one by 5 on the top and the bottom, and this one by 4 on the top and the bottom, so that the fractions stay equivalent, uh, allows us to get two fractions which then have the same denominator. So that will be 5 plus 5 over 20 plus 4 over 20. So that gives us 5. Add on 5 twentieths and 4 twentieths and altogether that is 9 twentieths. So we have 5 and 9 twentieths. 9 te twentieths doesn't simplify so that means 5 and 9 twentieths is the final answer. Question 1b is uh, again two mixed numbers. This time we are going to multiply. So in order to do that we need to first uh, make them top heavy fractions. So we have two and one third. So multiplying the two by the three that gives us six. Add the one on the top makes seven thirds. Multiplied by three and a half. So three times the two gives us six. Add the one on the top again gives us seven over 2. When we are multiplying fractions there's no need for the denominators to be the same. So we can simply multiply top by top 7 times 7 is 49 and bottom times bottom 3 times 2 is 6. So we now have 49 over 6 which is a top heavy fraction. We need to change that to a mixed number at this point and to do that we need to see how many times 6 will go into 49. It goes 8 times because 6 eights are 48. So that gives us 8 whole numbers. 6 eights were 48. We had 49, so that leaves us with one left over, which goes on the top. And then the 6, which was on the bottom, remains on the bottom. So we have 8 and 1 sixth as the final answer. Question number two in the non-calculator asks us to expand and collect like terms. We have double brackets here, so we've got x plus 2, everything in there, to multiply x plus 4, everything in there. So we do that one step at a time. We'll take the x first and multiply it by the second bracket, and then the positive 2 and multiply it by the second bracket. So move this up a little bit. So that's effectively like breaking the first bracket up. So first of all we have our x from the first bracket to multiply the second bracket. And then the positive 2 from the first bracket again to multiply the second bracket. So first of all we have x times x which is x squared. And then plus x times 4 which is 4x. On to the second one plus 2 times x is plus 2x and then positive 2 times positive 4 is positive 8. So now we look for like terms. We have an x squared term but no other like it. We have plus 4x and then just beside it another plus 2x and then on the end we have plus 8. So gathering the two terms in the middle together that gives us x squared plus 6x plus 8. There are no further like terms, so it's fully simplified, and that means we have our answer. Question B is another uh, double bracket question. So we multiply x plus 5 by the second bracket, x squared plus 3x plus 6. So we'll move that over slightly. So again, effectively we break the first bracket up. 
So we have x from the first bracket to multiply the second bracket, x squared plus 3x plus 6. And then we take the positive 5 from the first bracket, and again multiplying that second bracket, x squared plus 3x plus 6. So x times x squared, first of all, is x cubed. And then it's positive again, and x times 3x is 3x squared. Plus again, x times 6 is 6x. Moving on to the second bracket, we have positive 5 times x squared, which is plus 5x squared. And then 5 times 3x, which is 15x. And finally, 5 times 6, which is 30. So we're looking for our like terms again. So we have an x cubed, but nothing to go with this one. Here we have positive 3x squared, and later on plus 5x squared, so we can combine those. We have plus 6x and plus 15x. Again, we can combine those. And finally, we have plus 30 on its own. So putting the like terms together, so we have our x cubed at the front, then our 3x squared and 5x squared add together to give us 8x squared. Then we have positive 6x and positive 15x, which gives us plus 21x. And finally, our plus 30 on the end. We uh, don't have any more like terms to put together, so that means this is our final answer. Question number three in the non-calculator is a reversing the percentage change question. We're told the value of a TV falls by 40% and is now worth £480. What was the value before the fall in value? So we want to go back to the original value of the TV, which would be represented by 100%. Uh, uh, our TV has fallen in value by 40%, so that's 100 take away 40 which means our current value represents 60% of the original price. So that's what we write down first of all. We have 60% is equal to £480. What we need to do is find a way of getting back to 100%. So we need to find a percentage uh, in between that will help us get there. If we divide both sides by 3... So remember, if we do something to one side, we must do the same to the other. The reason we're going to do that is dividing 60% by 3 gives us 20%. And going from 20% back to 100% is a fairly easy process by times and by 5. So before we get there, we need to first of all divide 480 by 3. So if we take the 0 off, we can do that mentally. 48 divided by 3 is 16. Then simply add the 0 back on. 480 divided by 3 is 160. So if we now multiply by 5, remember to do the same on both sides. Then on uh, the left-hand side, 20% multiplied by 5 gives us 100% the desired percentage and the original value, which means we need to multiply 160 by 5. So once again, we can do that mentally. If we drop the 0 and uh, think of the number as 16, times in 16 by 5, 5 times 10 is 50, and 5 times the 6 is 30. 50 and 30 makes 80, so that gives us 80. Add the zero back on that we take, uh, took off at the start, and that gives us £800, which represents 100% and the original value of the TV. Question 4a in the non-calculator is uh, to solve a fairly straightforward equation. So we have 4x take away 2 equals 18. The first thing that we're going to do is take this negative 2, and move it to the other side of the equal sign. That gives us 4x equals and 18. 
and the negative 2, when it jumps across the equal sign, it changes to plus 2. So that gives us 4x equals 18 add 2, which is 20. We now move the 4 to the other side. 4 is times in the x at the moment, which means when we take that to the other side, it will divide. So we get 20 over 4. 20 divided by 4 is equal to 5, so x equals 5. B is another equation question, something similar. We have a positive 9, which we're going to move uh, to the right-hand side. So we have 5P equals negative 1. Move the plus 9 to the other side. When it jumps over the equal sign, it becomes negative 9. So that gives us 5P equals uh, negative 1, take away 9, which is negative 10. Again, taking the 5 over which means it will change from uh, multiply to divide. So we get negative 10 divided by 5. Again, that gives us a whole number answer. This time it's negative, negative 2. P equals negative 2. Question number 5 asks us to write each of the following in scientific notation. Uh, question A, first of all. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So we have 2,100,000. At present we can't see the decimal point, but since it's a whole number, we know the decimal point's located at the end. So we'll put that in there. In order to write it in scientific notation, we need to move the decimal point into a position between the 2 and the 1. So that involves jumping the decimal point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six places giving us our answer 2.1 times 10 to the power of 6 question B something similar again we have a whole number which means the decimal points located at the end we need to move it into the position between the 2 and the 5 in order to write it in scientific notation that involves jumping the decimal point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 places. Remember that the number at the front has to be a single digit, either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 or 9. So in this case it's 2.51. And we had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 jumps. So that's times 10 to the power of 5. Question number six is the first one in the calculator section. We're told that a house is valued at £80,000. The value of the house is expected to increase at a rate of 14% PA, which means per annum or per year. And it's going to do that every year for the next three years. The question asks us to find the value of the house in three years' time. So the quick way of doing these questions is, first of all, write down the current value, which is £80,000. And we are told that the uh, value of the house is going to increase. So that means that 14% is being added each year. So if we think about the original value being 100%, adding 14 to that gives us 114%. And writing that as a decimal is 1.14. So we multiply by 1.14. And we have to do that for a period of 3 years, which means we put the power 3 on the 1.14. So using our calculator to work out the next step, that gives us 118,500. And twenty three pounds and fifty two pence. So it doesn't tell us uh, to round it to any specific uh, number of uh, significant figures or to nearest uh, ten thousand pounds or whatever. But uh, estimating the value of a house in three years to the nearest penny, it doesn't seem quite right. So we'll take that step further. And we'll just round it to the nearest £10,000, 
which means the value of the house would be £120,000. Question number seven in the calculator section asks us to calculate the length of x. So x is this side on a right angle triangle. We should hopefully recognise that this question is a trigonometry question, so katoa. So we're given this angle here is 37 degrees. That means if we first of all label our uh, triangle, this side would be the opposite since it's opposite the angle. The 9 centimetre side is the longest side, it's therefore the hypotenuse, which means the other side must be the adjacent. What we want to do next is write down Sokatoa. So we'll do that in the familiar triangle setup. So ka toa. So the first thing we want to do is we want to put a question mark on the thing that we are trying to find, which is the opposite side in the triangle. So that's the the O. So we'll question mark the O's. And then we want to indicate the things that we already know. So we know the hypotenuse H is 9 centimetres, so we'll tick the H's. And since we know that the angle in the triangle is 37 degrees, then on our calculator we could work out sine 37, cos 37 or tan 37. We should find that one of Sokatoa has all three parts marked. And that's the one that we're going to use. And in this case, it is so. So the first thing that we write down is the thing with the question mark, which is the O. So it's opposite equals. And if we look at the uh, two things that are ticked, we can notice that they are sitting alongside each other rather than one above the other. So sitting alongside each other means a multiplication. So S stands for sin and it's sin 37 multiplied by the hypotenuse which is 9. So the opposite side is known as x and sin 37 degrees multiplied by 9 is equal to 5.4 and we'll round it off there at uh, that one decimal place and it would be 5.4 centimetres. So that's our answer corrected to one decimal place. Question number eight in the calculator part. We're told a shape comprises a semicylinder and a cuboid. We're asked to calculate the volume of the shape. So the shape itself here is a prism. We can tell that because if we were to slice from the front to the back eh, along the shape, then we would get the same size shape all the way along. The cross section is a sort of D shape. So each slice would be exactly the same size, which tells us it's a prism. In order to work out the volume of a prism, eh, the volume is V equals the area of the cross section, which is the face here at the front, multiplied by the length in this case, since the prism is lying on its side, and the length is the distance from the front face to the back face. So in order to uh, work out the volume here, we need to find the area of the cross section, this sort of D shape at the front. So we can quite clearly uh, see that that's made up of two separate shapes. If I draw a line down from here to here, then we can split it up into the two separate parts. We have this part here, which is a rectangle, and the part beside it, which is a semicircle. So if we can find the area of the rectangle and the area of the semicircle, then add them together, that will give us the area of the cross section. 
the area of the cross section is then multiplied by the length, which is 10 in this case, which then gives us the volume of the prism. So thinking about uh, these parts separately, we'll go for the area of the rectangle, first of all. So the area of a rectangle is given by the length times the breadth. So the length and breadth on our rectangle here is 27 by 16. So that's 27 multiplied by 16, which we can do on our calculator, which gives us 432, and that's square centimetres. Moving on to the yellow part, that's the semicircle. So we'll separate our work in using another heading. So as we have said, it's a semicircle. In order to find the area of a semicircle, we first find the area of the circle, then simply divide it by two. So we'll just move this up a little to give us some more space. So again, the area of a circle formula, just like the rectangle one, is one that we should know well. The area of a circle is A equals pi times the radius squared. If we look back at our shape, it's not obvious immediately what the radius would be. What we have here is this length coming from one side of the semicircle to the other, which would be known as the diameter. If we look over to this side of the shape, we can see that this length is 27, which means that the diameter of the semicircle will also be 27. We want the radius, however, which would just be half of that amount, so that would be 13.5. So substituting that into our formula gives us A equals pi multiplied by 13.5 squared. We can do that on our calculator, which gives us an answer of 572.6 square centimetres corrected to one decimal place. So what we have now is we have the area of the rectangle and the area of the semicircle, 432, 572.6. In order to find the total area of the cross section, A, we need to add these two amounts together. So we'll make a bit of space and do that under here. So that would be the total area. And that's 432 plus 572.6, which then gives us 1004. Point six square centimetres. So what we have now is we have the total area of the cross section. So thinking back to what we needed at the start, we were looking for the volume of the shape, which is a prism, and we get that using the formula V equals A times L. We now know the area of the cross section. We knew the area of the length which was 10. So all we need to do now is substitute into this formula and work out the final answer. So write the formula down again. V equals A times L. So the volume is 1004.6 multiplied by 10. So without even using a calculator, that's fairly straightforward, 10,046, and it's now 
cubic centimetres because we're talking about volume. And that's the final answer, the volume of our shape. So the square of the side we're looking to find, x, is equal to the longest side squared. Take away the other short side squared. So that's x squared equals 15 squared, which is 225. Take away 10 squared, which is 100. So that means that x squared is equal to 125 which means that x is equal to the square root of 125. Now, had this been in the non-calculator paper, we could have worked this out by simplifying a third. But since we are allowed to use a calculator here, we can simply use that to find the square root of 125, which gives us an answer correct to one decimal place of 11. 0.2 centimetres. That's the final answer, the length of side x.